Well, this is basically going to be a review of what we've done out of the Jenner Headlands in terms of our shaded fuel break work. Um, as you guys know, uh, we've been working on establishing the shaded fuel break on the main ridge line of the Jenner Headlands property. Uh, we started back in 2013, and so now we have about 130 acres of shaded fuel break, and we've applied prescribed fire to about 50 acres of that. We've done some vegetation sampling, which I'm going to show some of the data from that, as well as bring up some concepts of doing bird monitoring to get an idea of how we're changing the forest structure out there. Um, and then also get some insights in terms of wildlife habitat in general as we're managing the forest. Uh, various funders out there that have been important, Moore Foundation, NRCS, California Conservation Corps, and of course CAL FIRE. I think a lot of you uh, know what a shaded fuel break is, uh, but basically we're, uh, we've done some planning, uh, we've looked at fuel loads, and uh, we've identified some road systems along the main ridge line, and uh, we're trying to reduce fuel loads 150 feet on either side of the ridge top roads. Uh, we're trying to keep the large healthy trees, but get a good spacing in between the trees, breaking up that vertical and horizontal continuity of fuel loads, <clears throat> removing the uh, ladder fields. So those trees that we do keep, uh, we prune up to about 10 to 12 feet, as high as a pull, pole saw can reach. Uh, and again, breaking up that vertical continuity of ladder fuels. And then removing smaller trees and shrubs, reducing that, that fuel load. And the photos here on this slide are uh, a masticator using, a, or an excavator using a masticating head uh, to start to reduce some of these fuel loads along our road systems. And then lower on, uh, this lower picture is of a steeper area of the shaded fuel break. Uh, and that's the California Conservation Corps out there with uh, chainsaws doing lop and scatter on those steeper uh, hill slopes. And so uh, a few before and after pictures. Um, before, you know, we had a very choked uh, forest system. This area had been logged before. It had been hit by the Creighton Ridge fire. So very, very dense stands of hardwoods and conifers. Uh, and then afterwards, you can see that uh, the forest has been opened up. A lot of those ground fuels and those smaller trees have been broken down. They're now on the ground. Um, and so we've opened up that forest system. Uh, but there's still a lot of trees per acre. We haven't gone up there and just removed all of those trees. And then the trees that you see here in the after, uh, you know, as these trees grow up, uh, we will go back in and thin those out even more. We didn't want to go in and do uh, too heavy handed of a thinning uh, because then you bring in a lot of sunlight to the forest floor, you get a lot of regeneration. Uh, so this is a multi phased uh, project. Here's another photo before and after. Again, very dense uh, thicket on the left hand side and on the right hand side, you can begin to actually see through the forest and you can see that we've broken down the fuels down onto the ground. Uh, we try to get those fuels as close to ground level as possible, uh, 18 inches, two feet from ground level so that the, the soil microbes and everything can start breaking that down that material as quickly as possible because short term, we do have increased fuel loads uh, on the ground. We did put some uh, test plots into, or vegetation plots into our pilot project. Um, our pilot project was done in uh, 2013. We had about 10 plots where we went out there and we veg uh, sampled the vegetation. Uh, and then we, we uh, measured them, the, the vegetation plots in two different ways, trees per acre or stems per acre and then also basal area. Uh, and so this graph is showing you the trees per acre uh, pre and post treatment. And you can look at uh, the different species types, uh, but then we also have it broken down by conifer and hardwood. And if you look on over to the right hand side to these totals, you can see pre-treatment uh, in our shaded fuel break area, we had about 1,800 trees per acre. So a dog hair thicket of trees. Um, 
uh, you couldn't really even hike through there. It was you know, tearing at your clothes. Post-treatment, we've reduced that down to about 420 trees per acre. So of course, uh, from you know, the size of, of your finger, a DBH, to uh, a large tree. So this is just a straight count of stems per acre. So we reduced uh, it substantially, stems per acre. Looking at the next graph, we have basal area, square feet per acre. And again, if you go over to uh, look at the right-hand side of the graph and the totals, uh, you can see that pre-treatment, we had about 283 uh, square feet per acre, and we've reduced that down to about 205. Uh, so compared to the trees per acre, which were reduced substantially, the basal area hasn't been reduced all that much, and that's because we were keeping the biggest and best trees removing those smaller trees, breaking up that vertical and horizontal uh, continuity uh, of the forest stand out there. And then after that, yeah. Um, I just, out of curiosity, do you want the questions held for later or do, should, can we pop in and ask questions now? Oh, you can go ahead and ask questions now. Okay, I just was asked, really curious. It looked to me like most of the, um, removals came at the expense of the hardwoods and not the softwoods. Um, you know, your, your basically your, your redwoods and your uh, dug fir pretty much were exactly the same uh, right. pre and post treatment. And, you know, your madrone is, is, and presumably some of the oaks, which aren't listed here, ex except under hardwoods, are where things really got hit. Um, and can you Tell us a little bit about what your management objectives were here. I mean, I mean, sure. you said something about large trees. Were almost all the small trees hardwoods? Yeah, so this area did have a large uh, hardwood component. Fire, a lot of the hardwoods uh, re-sprouted and came back. Uh, but we also were selecting for conifers, particularly redwoods Red. and, and dug fir. Uh, we wanted to establish that uh, conifer evergreen forest. Those trees would be uh, have the they would be the biggest trees, the largest and broadest canopy. But then also, of course, redwood is is very fire resistant as well. So there was a selection. We did thin out the hardwoods. We did leave primarily the redwoods and the conifers. And that was part of our goals for that. So then the other component was uh, bringing in Cal Fire to do some uh, prescribed fire to those ground fuels. Um, so we worked with them to develop a vegetation management plan. Like I said, we've applied that to about 50 acres of our shaded fuel break. Uh, this helped reduce those areas that were masticated and lopped and scatter reduced that fuel load even further. Uh, but then there were, after we established our shaded fuel break, there were a lot of hardwoods that re-sprouted. Um, and so this prescribed fire helped knock back those re-sprouting areas. So uh, reduces the fuel load and helps maintain uh, the shaded fuel break up there on the East Ridge. And so this is a quick map of uh, what we've worked on over on the right hand side in this blue and red. This is our East Ridge shaded fuel break. We've established about 100 acres there. Uh, the red polygons are areas where we have applied uh, prescribed fire. Uh, and that's been pretty much directed by Cal Fire for the most part. Uh, these areas were easily accessible. Um, the units were easy to set up in terms of making sure that we had some control measures uh, when we did apply the prescribed fire. There they are. And then over on this West Ridge, you can see that we've uh, established about 30 acres of shaded fuel break in the blue. And then we have yet to finish that Western uh, shaded fuel break, which is actually part of a timber harvest plan that Fred is working on with us. Um, and so the idea is once we've established this Western shaded fuel break, uh, again, work with CAL FIRE and try to apply prescribed fire to help maintain and reduce these fuel loads. 
the other component that I want to talk about was using birds as indicator species. You know, as we come in and we start to manage these forests, we change the uh, forest stand structure. Uh, you can use birds as an indicator of, of how you're changing the forest uh, structure. Um, there's specific birds that uh, have very specific habitat parameters, uh, vegetation structure. And so by going out there and monitoring bird species, you can get an idea how your management is not only affecting stand structure, but then also wildlife habitat. And Partners in Flight have developed a series of different conservation plans. They have one on coniferous forests, uh, shown here, but they have one on riparian areas, oak woodlands, grassland habitats as well, and again, using birds as indicator species. Over on the right-hand side, it's actually part of their website where you can actually click on each one of these uh, species, and you can get a detailed account of focal species and their preferred habitat types. And so we did hire on uh, Point Blue, uh, to come out and do some surveys on the Jenner Headlands. This is a quick map of their point count locations. Again, you can see the East Ridge. Uh, they place their point counts on the East Ridge in red, but then also what we're calling our restoration forestry uh, component where we're thinning out the forest, again, leaving the big and best trees, but we're not necessarily focused on fuel reduction. And so the idea was to have them come out, do uh, these point count and bird monitoring pre-treatment, uh, and then have them come out post-treatment. Unfortunately, we've had trouble uh, with the funding and the post-treatment, uh, but again, the idea is to have them come out and do these bird monitoring and uh, come up with a list of focal species, get an idea how we are changing the stand structure out there. So from these surveys that they've done, uh, they came up with a proposed list of focal species. These are species that they did find out in the forest. Um, and so you can see the list of species here on the left. And was, as we go over right, their conservation plan. Some of these are listed in the California plan. Some of them are in the Oregon or Washington plan. Uh, nest locations, and then also habitat attributes. So if you find these species within the forested uh, ecosystem, these are some of the key attributes uh, that need to be present in order for these uh, bird species to be present as well. And if they have detailed information on each species, uh, they can even have an, uh, suggested population numbers that uh, if you have you know, a healthy forest ecosystem, you would have X amount of uh, specific bird species within that forest ecosystem. Uh, the other thing that the bird monitoring will help figure out is as we're thinning out the forest, opening up the canopy, we want to make sure that we're not um, uh, introducing, you know, uh, uh, parasitic bird species like uh, brown-headed cowbirds and other brood parasites uh, that would be, uh, you know, um, harmful to the bird species out there. So here's an example of a focal species, uh, pileated woodpecker. Uh, it is a forest indicator species, uh, needs large standing dead trees, uh, dead and down woody material, and prefers forests with tall, large diameter trees. Um, it is also a, a keystone species. It, it modifies its habitat, excavates large nests, and uh, provides cavities for other species. So just having this bird species present gives you an idea of some of the components that are present within your forest ecosystem, uh, but then also you have an understanding that it's actually creating additional habitat for these other uh, wildlife species. And so in the Russian Gulch area where we have our restoration forestry uh, uh, timber harvest plant, they actually found uh, two nesting pairs of um, uh, pileated woodpeckers in that area. Uh, they have pretty broad ranges, so a high population density ne isn't necessarily indicative, uh, indicative of a, um, a healthy, but just having them present uh, gives you an idea of the forest stand structure and some of these components that you have in the forested area. Uh, the follow-up that we did on our shaded fuel break, unfortunately, uh, we haven't really been able to do follow-up surveys in terms of bird species out there. 
but on the East Ridge, we did get some baseline data, and then they were able to do a, a subsampling within 20 acres um, of a pilot project. And just in that area, comparing uh, the pilot project pre and post treatment, they did find a 30% uh, higher species richness in that post treatment plot. Uh, and so the plot was uh, pre treatment 2013 post treatment was 2014 2014 they did find new species in that area uh, mountain quail and its hummingbird red vested nuthatch uh, american uh, robin and tanager as well as american goldfinch those species that were were lost once we opened up that forest uh, stand were uh, western wood peewee and also the golden crowned kinglet so it gives you an idea how uh, modifying that forest stand structure, you're also starting to get a different suite of species out there. Um, and so I just wanted to bring this up because I think birds, uh, bird monitoring can really be an important component of our monitoring and how we're altering this forest stand structure. And it gives us an idea of the structure within these forest ecosystems uh, just by having them presence or looking at their population numbers and studying instead of going out there and trying to quantify snags per acre and how much down woody debris do you have, you can use these bird species as an indicator of some of these habitat components that you might be trying to develop uh, within your forested landscape. And so that's just a quick summary of what we've done out here on the Jenner Headlands. Wow, that was that was amazing, Brooke. Thank you very much. I'm surprised at how, um, yeah, just how how jam packed and awesome this presentation is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the and the idea is really to uh, get more funding so that we can continue to do this post treatment monitoring because that's really, of course, the important component is is how are we altering these these forested landscapes and. Uh, what's the, the the change in bird species that we see out there using that as kind of an adaptive management feedback mechanism yeah. does anyone else have questions for brooke before we switch jason i do brooke a uh, quick question on i got i have a few but just a quick question on funding uh how, how are you able to secure funding for this project so this, uh, the 20, uh, 2013 and 2014, that was actually funding through the Moore Foundation. So as part of the Jenner, Jenner Headlands project, when it was acquired, uh, we also developed a stewardship fund that provided some seed money to get a lot of these projects going. Uh, and so we did have money to, to uh, do the bird monitoring from the Moore Foundation. Um, and the, the long-term goal was that as we did our restoration forestry uh, management, um, that model is kind of based on a, a revenue generating model where we're thinning out the forest, but we're able to get revenue from those merchantable trees. And that money would go into uh, continuing restoration forestry, but then also monitoring uh, such as this for the, the bird populations that revenue generating model uh, has really not been engaged. Um, we've had some problems out there just uh, thinning out our restoration forestry areas uh, for a variety of different reasons, but that's, that's the funding mechanism. So if you guys have any ideas on how to do this type of uh, monitoring, other additional funding sources, um, I would be welcome to hear uh, any ideas that you have. Hi. Can you guys hear me? I have I have one other technical question, if you don't mind, Bert. Um, yeah, go ahead, Brooke. Uh, one thing I noticed from you know doing a similar fuel break project, you know, we're going after standing dead hardwood trees, and after a while, we started noticing more bird activity in the really dead tan oaks, those standing dead tan oaks. So you know, at first we were kind of prioritizing those for thinning, and then. Later, we actually saw them as providing like really good nesting habitat as opposed to like the standing dead madrones where we saw little to no nesting activity. Is that something like, were you able to kind of like, you know, set aside some habitat 
as you're doing these or was that just too complicated? Uh, we did want to uh, leave uh, certain snags per acre. We didn't want to remove all of that, uh, all of those components, uh, even though it was a fuel reduction project. Um, and actually, we, when we did this work in 2013, that particular stand up there had not been hit all that much by, by sods. Um, but uh, we have found that the, the tan oaks that we have left and, and some of these areas were tan oak thickets, and so we just thin the tan oaks, and it's a, uh, a lot of those trees uh, have succumbed to sods. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's interesting to hear that they've also been habitat, become habitat. Um, and uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, we're losing a lot of our tan oaks up there. Um, and as it's actually a, a hazard as we do prescribe fire on the ground floor, uh, we found that sometimes just the heating of the forested area, some of those trees are actually coming down as we're burning the forest. Uh -huh. um, so just uh, another uh, tidbit of, of information um, in terms of um, some of the dangers out there and hazards. Um, that was my last little question, which is basically, uh, you know, in retrospect, what I've heard is the Lapin scatters can generate intensive heat when you go in to introduce fire after it. I haven't seen this, but this is just something I've heard. So, you know, in retrospect, did you like that Lapin scatter over a pile burn technique? Did that work out well for you? What, what did you kind of take from that whole experience? Uh, we didn't do a whole lot of pile burning. Um, although, if I were to do it again, uh, I into uh, the shaded fuel break work. Uh, you know, ideally, mastication works really well. It, it breaks down the material. Um, the lop and scatter, um, that's all that the seas could do. So there were large areas that were just lop and scatter, and it did seem to provide a pretty intense heat when we were burning. Um, so ideally, you know, mastication kind of really breaks down that fuel source. Um, and uh, but in terms of funding that the seas had their own funding and so uh, we kind of just turned them loose out on the shaded fuel break area. Gotcha thanks Brooke. Thank you. Let's take one more question. Um, Jean yeah let's take your question and then and then leave it there so that we can. Okay, hear from Brad. It's, it's really great to see that Brooke. I was out on that uh, I worked on that timber harvest plan as one of the review people and then later went out and saw where the control uh, burn had been and it really looks a lot better. It's exciting to know that it's 30 percent higher species uh, richness. I'm assuming you did the burn burn outside of nesting season right? Yes well this this data right here uh, the species richness this was just from uh, after mechanical uh, application and so this doesn't reflect uh, any burning and yeah. then the burning the burning uh, is done primarily in the fall but okay. we have had some uh, winter burning in, uh, in February. Yeah yeah and uh, is there is there any possibility that the Audubon Society might provide some monitoring it's really important to have monitoring afterwards because that really shows the success. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't really reached out to Audubon, but that would and be- And they may have other ideas too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, if these areas were easy, uh, I, I would have uh, probably tried to initiate some kind of maybe volunteer citizen scientist, uh, but it's, you need a four wheel drive. It's really hard to get to, very remote. Um, and so it's kind of uh, prohibited that development of that kind of program. Thank you. All right, Thanks. thank you, Brooke, so much. Um